coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada. Streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Float, Odyssey, and Telegram. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim, and this is the Workshop Podcast. Today is episode 126. It's June 10th, 2022, and our guest today is Rick Austin of Prepper Camp. So let's bring him on. Hey, Rick, how are you? Doing good. How are you doing? Very good. I appreciate it. I, I reached out to you there, I don't know, months, six weeks ago, and appreciate that you uh, took the invitation and came on. So thank you. Not a problem. Right on. So let's start. I always, we're, we're kind of workshop oriented here. So I always like to get people's backstory, you know, start where you came from. And uh, I always like people to touch on what was your first job you had in high school? Uh, well, my first job was, uh, working for my dad, who was a plumbing and heating contractor. Um, so I worked for him, you know, afternoons and summers and, and, uh, you know, learn the construction business. And, you know, as a plumber, um, you learn to be an electrician and a carpenter and all that other sort of stuff. So you learn all that stuff. And so, you know, I, I did a lot of tool man stuff myself for a long time and then got into, uh, building cars and that sort of stuff. So it, it was, um, it was a good upbringing. And, and since I grew up in New Hampshire, I, you know, I learned to uh, live in a, in an environment where, you know, we had that kind of that Puritan worth work ethic. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you would lose uh, power for, you know, two weeks at a time due to an ice storm, snowstorm. So you learn to uh, cook with wood, heat with wood, uh, take your stuff out of your refrigerator and stick it in the snow. Cause that's how it's going <laughs> to stay, stay fresh. Um, and, uh, you know, so I did that. And, and the interesting thing about my father is, um, he was the largest installer of solar heat and hot water systems in the Northeast in the 1970s. So, uh, I've been at this a long time and, you know, every house that I built, um, when I was, you know, getting th as an adult, basically, um, had newer technology uh, than what was in the 1970s. So, you know, we uh, we went from from, uh, you know, what was available at that time and eventually, you know, where we are right now, which is a, a house that's that's made of, uh, you know, concrete hardy board. So nothing can bore through it. It's fireproof and um, and it's it has isonine spray and foam insulation. That's not the kind of foam insulation that gases formaldehyde. This is this is actually made out of ca castor beans. So um, you know the whole house is in an envelope of insulation, and it takes practically nothing to heat it. And you know we're on the south side of a mountain and facing south, so we get all that good free passive solar energy to heat our home and uh, heat our hot water too through our greenhouse. Because uh, we've got uh, coils that run through the greenhouse at the roof, uh, just black, just yep. one inch black coils that are in hundred foot coils. You know, I was at Lowe's one day and uh, I was looking at this black pipe that's underground pipe normally, and I it's all stored outside. And I went to touch it and pick it, and I literally burned my hand. And then a uh, light bulb went off, and I said, "Hey, if I run cold water through that." <laughs> then maybe that'll heat up. So I've got 800 feet of coiled pipe at the top of my greenhouse that heats our hot water year, year round. So my, I get water that's 140 degrees without having to uh, use any electricity or anything else to to uh, heat it up. Right. <clears throat> Your dad was in, he was kind of on the cusp of that 1970s back to the land movement then, was he? Or at least make, making a little bit of money off it, was he? The... the uh, yeah the solar hot water heating and that sort oh, of yeah. thing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There was like, there was uh, huge incentives for, so he was, you know, he was way ahead of the curve and that stuff and doing the installations. And um, so I learned a lot about uh, all kinds of different solar systems. And what I learned over the years is the simpler, the better, mm -hmm. uh, the cheaper and less problematic. Cause you know, the early systems were, were a uh, glycol system. So you had glycol running up to the roof going through panels and then coming back down and then there was a heat exchange area uh, and that exchanged heat with the hot water and so you've got a lot of electromechanical devices that uh, that could fail and did um, yes so 
you know, it was the early, early beginnings. And, you know, we, we do as much as we can uh, by having the right infrastructure in place and, and building um, the right way. I mean, the, 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 what I learned from the construction business and, and building several homes, this is, you know, this is our last resort, I hope, you know, here we are. Um, I like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, your, your audience is into, into building and stuff. Well, um, you know, what's the, what's the typical size of most sheet material, you know, when you go to build, what size is it? Four by eight. Four by eight. You got it. You got it. Well, I worked on a lot of homes growing up that, uh, you know, had lots of jogs and lots of gables and, you know, L's and T's and, you know, the buildings were a beautiful design, but totally inefficient in terms of trying to store heat because the more surface area you have, the uh, the more that um, you have an opportunity to to lose uh, heat in the wintertime or, you know, harder to cool in the summertime. So, you know, the most efficient design is a, is a box, you know, a, a rectangle. And um, we built this home. Uh, it's 24 by 36, all right. in increments of four by eight, eight foot tall in the f first floor, eight foot tall in the second floor. Uh, the waste was as big as my kitchen table is as much waste as we had for the entire uh, framing of the of the project. And that's pretty much unheard of when you, you know, you're yeah. building a house. So, um, you know, we just it, we used and that saves you a lot of money too. you know, just an efficient way to, to build and efficient from a energy standpoint and uh, efficient uh, in terms of not wasting uh, materials. Man, that's cool. I, I could do a whole interview just on that. That's awesome. Well, I'm right. I'm writing a book on it. If we if we still have a world and a country by the time I get it done, I'm trying to get it done before prepper camp. So I've been talking about it for three years. But, uh, you know, stuff just happens, um, you know, and when you get over 100 animals, there's always something that's going to be a problem. So. That's our, I get it. Yeah. I get, I get about three books beating around up here and it, it's just, it's, it's the time between business yep. and content. Yeah. Whatever. No. Nope, yeah. But that's cool. I'm yeah. I can't wait. I'd love to read it. That I, I just, I, I know the waste I've seen and I, I do pretty good at collecting some of that waste. Sometimes, you know, people have little off cuts. Oh, yeah. so mm -hmm. I save it all because yeah, you can build out yeah. of it, make things. Yep. Yeah. We did too. We did too. And, and you know, the, in the in the worst case scenario anything that wasn't pressure treated was something that could be burnable even if it was small pieces so since we got a wood stove that is our backup source of heat you know that was that was good to have too for just you know number two pine literally yeah so how'd you uh i mean most everybody knows the name rick austin at least in the preparedness field at this point and you know i i don't know if we use the word celebrity whatever you want to call it but how did you everybody starts as a prepper how did you start where did you how'd you get into things was it I think I was five. I okay. think I was five years old. I, I don't know. I, I've, I've always been, um, you know, kind of a Boy Scout. Uh, went to the Boy Scouts, you know, went through the Boy Scouts. And, and uh, again, you know, because I grew up in New Hampshire, you know, I learned to, to cook and heat with wood and just kind of, you know, be one of those hardy New Englanders. Um, so, I, you know, uh, there's an old story. We were on Mount Washington, which is the highest peak in in the uh, I think in the Northeast. Um, and, uh, you know, um, my father was joking how Rick was, Rick was ready not to fall off the edge of the mountain because, uh, you know, he was keeping his distance or something when everybody else was clowning around up there just cause, you know, I, I, I am a, I'm not a big risk taker. Um, yeah. you know, I've, I've run many businesses, but, uh, you know, what I like is that, you know, I'm in control. So, um, you know, I, I like that about, uh, you know, what we're doing here, too, because if you're if you're you got an everyday job and I'll tell you, you're you're slave labor right now and uh, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I mean, we just filled up uh, three three gas cans, five gallon gas cans. No, there were four five gallon yeah. gas cans for my uh, my mower uh, and uh, my tractor, which is really just a small a 22 horse lawn tractor, which I use to maintain our two miles of road that we have here. Um, and you know, it's all uphill. So we get washouts and heavy rains and stuff like that. And, um, you know, that was 75 bucks to fill up yesterday and that's us dollars. Yeah. Um, freedom so, dollars. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was kind of a shock, you know. Um, yeah. So it's it's happening, and it's it's all been planned. It's all oh, yeah. part of the the great reset, and uh, you know, destroy destroy the West, destroy the United States of America, destroy Canada. Um, you know, any any hope of freedom and and individuality to uh, to to put in the new world order, and they're not even being shy about it anymore. As far as, like you said, slave labor employed by somebody else, I think a tenant of modern survivalism should be entrepreneurship because you have so mm -hmm. the last two years with all the bullshit that's gone on over the last two years, I was basically unaffected running my own business. I could go where I want, do what I want, you know, make what I wanted within reason. And it was great. But boy, I would hate to have had to have spent the last two years working for someone else. I can't imagine. Right. right. But yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I've, I, you know, I grew up the son of an entrepreneur, and I've been an entrepreneur pretty much all my life. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I was in the, the marketing and advertising business, and you know, and and uh, kind of went from from there to uh, television business, and you know, ended up, uh, you know, my wife and I retired at age fifty. That was fifteen years ago, and um, you know, we just said we're gonna jump off the cliff and do this thing that I've been hoping to do before. And, uh, you know, we end up, uh, going off grid and growing all of our own food. And, uh, you know, we did it in, in, in dabbled in it before and uh, finally just said, okay, that's it. We're done. And, um, you know, it was, we just jumped off the cliff and never looked back and so glad that we did because, uh, you know, my, my food forest that provides all the food on less than half an acre of land for myself, my family, um, and all of my animals um, is uh, just amazing because it's it's like the Garden of Eden. It's my secret garden of survival. And, uh, you know, you plant once and harvest for a lifetime. And the, the neat thing is that all of those fruit trees, berry bushes, nut trees, um, you know, herbs, over time, they just grow bigger and spread out. And, um, you know, now when we used to get, uh, you know, five, 10 gallons of, of, uh, peaches off of a tree, um, you know, we get, um, three, a gorilla cart fulls, you know, wow. um, and you know, the, the, uh, I'm smiling cause the, the bad thing is that you've got to process all of that. And <laughs> my, my, my unfortunate uh, survivor, Jane, my wife is, you know, that's her job. And she does everything from, you know, dehydrating to canning to making, you know, making preserves like they used to do in the old days um, to, um, you know, we recently bought a, a freeze dryer and oh. uh, just, uh, I mean, it's an expensive investment and it, you know, they never, they never really told you how much power that thing takes, not just the power it takes to run, and that it takes 24 to 48 hours to process one batch. Um, but also it puts off a tremendous amount of heat. So if hmm. you've got a very tight house like we do, um, now you've got to cool the house. So that's additional electricity or you know energy you've got to use to, to cool the thing from the heat that's being put off by the, you know, the freeze dryer. Now, if we were doing this in wintertime, it would be great. But the whole point is preserving things like apples and pears mm -hmm. and peaches that ain't going to sit around for uh, six months because um, they're going to rot before that happens. So, um, you know, you got to do what you got to do and you got to you know, make hay where the sun shines and, you know, do everything we can to to preserve stuff. And, and my wife is is, uh, you know, just going uh, absolutely balls to the wall on all of this stuff because she sees the end is near and, you know, we've got to put away as much as we possibly can and, and, uh, you know, you get stuff done because when, you know, the, the population and when the pe plebes and peons are all starving because there ain't no food, uh, at the grocery store, um, and there's no more gasoline to get anywhere, um, that's when society falls apart and that's when you start having people kill each other for you know, those resources. And you have, I mean, you look at what happened to, at Hurricane Katrina um, in three days, 
in three days it went to absolute anarchy and every man and woman for themselves and uh you know just total chaos and, and collapse of civilization um so it doesn't take long for that to happen and you know that the 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 dod the war you know the war department have all war game this whole thing out they know what's going to happen they know how long we're going to last and you know what's so so the people that be left to be people like you and i and hopefully some of your audience that are prepared and looking out for this stuff and the other people that will be left are the really 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 bad psychopaths sure um, so that's who we're going to be dealing with and it is going to be the walking dead for a while um you know when when all of this you know, comes to fruition so you started this food forest farm what do they say oh i've heard it said a few times the second best time to plant a tree is now of course the first time was 15 yeah. years ago when you started right, right? so right. Um, <clears throat> how did you get started i i mean you always have to do what you can do right now right so where, yeah. where did you start like what how did you even get into this hidden food for well i you know i um when i was in new hampshire i um i had uh apple orchards and um you know nice. i i bought an old apple orchard and put a house in there and you know um it was kind of a novelty and I had acres and acres of trees that were just like, you know, every apple orchard where you've got trees that are all in straight rows this way and straight rows that way. And the branches touching each other and grass grows in between. And, you know, um, little did I know that the grass sucked up the same nutrients the apple trees needed. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, you, you I sprayed pesticide uh, every 10 days and after every rain Oh, use wow. fertilizer, use all the chemicals that were, you know, conventional wisdom, what you do use. And I still had scabby, wormy apples, just like every other apple farmer. So um, I just, you know, did what I did, what I could spend a lot of money doing it and um, just knew that there was something not right with this picture and um, did the same thing when I was in Florida. Uh, I spent okay. about 20 years there and, um, you know, we had citrus. Um, and did the same thing you know just uh so when we were um you know moving off grid i had been reading about this quote permaculture stuff I was and, gonna ask. Um, yep. okay. so you know I, I and i and i read the 400 page books by all these eggheads that can't speak um you know to a normal person and uh you know <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm not a stupid guy myself. So, I mean, it kind of went through all of this and just realized how difficult it was for people to understand yep. and put together a plan and a map and what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was a, it was all a big experiment. And, um, you know, I, I created these little guilds and, you know, the, the way the system works is, you know, nature doesn't grow anything in straight rows. So, right. um, you know, you start with a tree and that tree starts as a, a seedling and then that tree grows up and grows out and yeah. then suddenly you have a canopy and underneath that canopy is full shade and there's certain plants that enjoy that shade and there's a symbiotic relationship between that fruit tree and those plants that are underneath it sure then outside of that canopy you've got full sun again and you know that's where you plant your berry bushes like your blueberries blackberries elderberries raspberries um you know that sort of stuff and then outside of so they now you've got in a circle around around your fruit tree yep. and then you've got another circle of sun full sun and that's where you plant your herbs you know your cooking herbs your medicinal herbs that kind of stuff and uh you know those things flower all the time they've got tiny little florets that bring in the pollinators to pollinate your other fruit and they also bring in the predatory wasp that will kill the bad bugs that you don't want to have on your fruit inside so what you've got is you've got a defensive perimeter around all your fruit and sure. you know that is nature's pesticide that's how it works so nature doesn't grow things in straight rows it grows things in concentric circles and so you know outside of that you've got your ground cover layer and ground cover can be anything from from clover to strawberries and uh, you know clover and peanuts and peas and beans they're all nitrogen fixers um, they take nitrogen out of the out of the air and they put it back into the soil. So there's your natural fertilizer for all the plants around it. So there's a huge symbiotic relationship between all of those those plants. 
in that little ecosystem. And then I've got 40 of those ecosystems touching each other. Um, you know, so I've got, you know, different pear trees, different apple trees, different peach trees, um, you know, that are the basis and nut trees that are the basis of all this and um you know figs and you know, basically we grow every fruit tree berry bush grape that'll grow in our region in the appalachian mountains here and um you know it it all works great i mean you know it was it was amazing how much i mean we had more food than we could eat in the first year wow. um, and uh and in the second year i mean things just grew bigger and grew out and produced more food and so now, you know, we've got, um, you know, when I say a gorilla cart, I'm talking about the big gorilla cart out there. And uh, last year off of one Asian pear tree, we've got uh, three, um, you know, topped off uh, gorilla carts full. And, uh, you know, one cart had kind of kind of crappy fruit with some, you know, some not very good looking stuff and things the bugs had gotten into and some of the drops and everything else. Well, that's the stuff that you give to the chickens. Sure. So they, they love that stuff and it feeds them. And then you've got the stuff that's, you know, not quite so bad that you end up giving to the pigs and you end up feeding your goats with and, you know, that sort of thing. And then the, the pristine, you know, a number one stuff is the stuff that we, you know, we keep, and uh you know my wife's unfortunate job is to preserve all that stuff and um i mean at some point in the the middle of the season after i'm bringing in six to 12 gallons of fruit every single day she uh she screams stop i can't do this anymore <laughs> so i you know i hate to admit it but we've got three freezers that we put stuff in and then you know she will take her time so to speak uh instead of 18 hours a day you know, uh, a little less than that so that she can get all that stuff preserved and, uh, and stored for us. Um, Chris so, there, he, he just asked, <laughs> do you do any grafting for varieties or just let it be? I really don't do any grafting. I mean, we, you know, yeah. you, you need something that's going to be good rootstock. And, you know, what I suggest to people is that they, they go to a, um, a, nur a local nursery, people that actually grow stuff that's indigenous to their area because what will grow where you are and what will grow where I am, you know, there, you could have apple trees that will grow where you are and apple trees that grow where I am, but they're not indigenous to the area and they're not, um, well, let's, let's say, you know, there's, there's this thing called, um, uh, for, uh, yeah, that's okay. It's, it's chill hours. So, so, you know, it's a number of, number of times or number mm -hmm. of hours that are below 45 degrees. So, yes, you know, you get more of those chill hours than I do. And the trees that grow in your area are used to waiting longer to say, okay, it's spring. Now I can set out my buds and the bees will pollinate them and I will get fruit. The trees down here in the Southeast United States, um, after they get a certain amount of chill hours to say, okay, spring's here. Uh, right. Let's go. Let's go. Well, you know, if you take a tree from my area and put it up in your area, that thing will will bloom way too soon. You'll have a frost. It'll kill everything. And, you know, the tree will f eventually put out leaves and that sort of stuff, but you won't have any fruit. So, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, if you're buying, f you know, trees, fruit trees from the big box stores, those are coming from 1,500 miles away. You don't know right. what, you know, what they are and they're pumped up on drugs, you know, they're pumped up on fertilizer and stuff to, they look good in the store, but once you get them home, they wither and die. So, you know, go to a local nursery that can, um, you know, that understands at least the concept of permaculture and that will give you, you know, fruit trees and berry bushes that are acclimated to your area and acclimated to your area in terms of pests and, you know, other stuff too. Um, you know, we've got, We've got grapes that we grow here that are Concord grapes. I love Concord grapes. Oh, you know, they grow in bunches, but they've got thin skins. And, um, you know, the, the wasp will sting those skins so they can suck the juice out of the grapes before they're ripe. And what happens is they, they literally start fermenting on the vine. And, sure. And, um, you know, they drop off. And since my ducks go through my garden and eat the bugs and slugs and snails that I don't want to have on my, my fruit, um, they're picking up these uh, 
you know, these grapes that are fermented already. And I got a bunch of drunk ducks walking around, you know, sideways in the garden. Um, I would where, but you know, muscadines and scuppernog grapes are indigenous to this area. They have very thick skin, so mm -hmm. that doesn't happen to them. And we don't have that issue. Have you ever had, um, either an infestation or disease go through with, with this system much or, or not too bad? Um, you know, it's like Miyamoto Mustachi's uh, saying that which does not kill us makes us stronger. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had some, uh, some cedar rust go through some of my pear trees and I thought about putting something and even some organic chemicals on it. And then I read what's in there and you're not supposed to let your, your animals near it. And mm -hmm. I'm go I'm reading the, the, you know, the, the, the problems and the, and the, the dangers that they're talking about. And I said, this is organic. And I said, no, mm. you know, I am just not going to do it. And, um, you know, I just let nature take its course and they get over that and it makes them a stronger tree and you know they just get taller and bigger and produce more fruit so they're more resistant to that kind of stuff if you let nature take its course so as much as possible i i um i just step back and watch what's happening and then you know when stuff is ripe i go through and pick it nice yeah no that's good um so you, I, I'm, we can touch. I, I, I'd love, I'd take a whole hour talking on this. You're well, I, I, I do teach an hour long class at prepper camp. So, well, that's where I was <laughs> heading. So you're, you're a natural teacher, aren't you? That like, where did that come? You always been a teacher too. Always wanting to share what you know. Um, you know, I figure the more people that, that use my system and can feed themselves, the less I have to shoot when it comes time to, to do it. So <laughs> that's great. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I just, you know what happened is when we were on doomsday preppers my wife and i uh survivor jane and i we you know we became a commodity that was wanted by all of these guys that were doing prepper shows all over the united states so sure. you know they they'd pay for us to come out put us up and you know we were there because we knew this stuff and we were trying to teach people what we how we live mm -hmm. and um you know we uh we were into doing that and and what we realized is that most of these these guys that were putting on these shows were not preppers themselves they were just mm -hmm. you know slime balls that were just out there trying to make a buck on the next craze um and uh you know they didn't really care about it they were just trying to pack the place with vendors and sell stuff and what we saw people that went there the attendees they they wanted to know how to use things and uh so they they're the ones that, um, you know, we just said, hey, these people want to learn. So, yeah. you know, we were teaching them stuff. And, and that's how I ended up writing a book, you know, on the secret garden of survival, because, you know, people kept saying, wow, this is great. Um, you know, you need to write a book so we can find out how to do this. And the good news is because this is a huge experiment for us, um, you know, I took pictures all along the way. And, you know, fortunately, oh. I, you know, I had all that stuff that I could use in the book. And having been a marketing guy my entire life, I realized that, you know, people will, read, will look at pictures and read captions and headlines before they ever read a word of copy. So, <laughs> you know, it's really kind of a picture book that shows you how to do what we do, you know, in the garden. Um, just, you know, every step of the way from, you know, how to pick the right right location and land how to how to get the land set and squared away and uh, you know we grow on top on the side of a mountain on the south side of a mountain in conventional wisdom you would never grow on a on a steep slope like that but we put in terraces so you know water runs downhill and yep. uh, you know we get the terraces and the water just kind of sinks in there and um, you know the uh, the plants because they're perennials they put in put down deeper roots as opposed to your annuals that which have a three month life cycle you know from mm -hmm. from seed to seedling to flower to fruit you know so your you know your garden variety vegetables of any kind from cucumbers to to squash you know that's what they do they have a three month life cycle well these things because they're perennials you know they can last a lot longer um so so droughts don't affect them as much you know too much cold too much wind too much heat um you know too much winter um you know they can withstand the test of time and uh, you know so you plant once and you harvest for a lifetime and um you know the, the plants and trees just get bigger and everything kind of fills in and you know everybody gets along 
and um, you know we um, we have a tremendous amount of food. And the, and the beauty of the system is, you know, I call it the secret garden of survival because it's all hiding in plain sight. I mean, it, it yeah. just looks like an overgrown, you know, area that somebody just abandoned and. You know, there's nothing to see here as opposed to a traditional garden that's in straight rows. Um, you know, when when we do have the, the zombie apocalypse and everybody's, you know, leaving the big cities and heading for the hills, the poor little farmers and mom and pops that, uh, you know, are growing their garden in straight rows, they're going to be, you know, attacked like locusts. And, um, and if they're going to assume those people have food, you know, stored in their house and, you know, you're going to have they're going to be overrun. So, you know, in, in my situation, first of all, it's a long way up my hill. Um, you know, I got two miles of roads and it's all uphill. So, you know, it's it's kind of like the fox and the grapes. It's just kind of like, well, you know, <laughs> we'll just do the, the low hanging fruit. Um, but, you know, if somebody gets up here, there's nothing to see here. I can't believe how accessible you make permaculture. I, like you didn't even use the term swales. You just called it a terrace. Everybody knows what a terrace is, right? Like it's just hmm. there. The water collects and. Yeah. yeah, it's great. I, you just, yeah, you're a natural born teacher. I appreciate that. <laughs> so well, it's probably why you started prepper camp. Is it? Is that a, a bit of it? Well, yeah. Well, actually, we oh. started prepper camp because we were disgusted with the people that were trying to make a buck and on all of these people who were truly trying to be prepared. And you know, we we got together with a few of our other um, other speakers in the circuit, and we said, hey, you know, we'd like to do an event that we would want to attend. You know, in okay. an environment that's not a convention center, you know, where, you know, you're not butt to butt and elbow to elbow. <laughs> and, you know, it, you have a chance to actually test and try this stuff that you're learning. I mean, you know, you get a chance to do, you know, yeah. try to make a fire or use a Dutch oven, or you can't do that in a convention center. So, um, you know, we said, let's, we love to do something like that. So we, we found a place in the Appalachian mountains, a, you know, a huge campground, and uh, we actually found them because they went to a uh, to another place that we were, you know, Jane and I were teaching and, uh, you know, they wanted to buy goats from us. And so one thing led to another and we found out they had a campground and we took, uh, you know, Mr. Toad's wild ride on his uh, golf cart through his place. And it's like, man, this would be perfect. And uh, so we, um, we decided we we're going to do prepper camp. And the first year was, you know, we didn't know if we'd do a second one. Um, but it was phenomenally successful. And, um, you know, this is this will be our ninth year. We're the largest outdoor preparedness event and homesteading event in in the nation. And, you know, I'm sure Canada, probably the world. But, oh, I'm sure. um, you know, there's not a lot of other places to do anything like that. But, you know, we have people coming up from all over, you know, the U.S., Canada and, uh, you know, as far away as Australia um, to come to this event to learn how to do what we do. And we have um you know over 30 of the best instructors in the world in their particular field so you know we got a guy who who teaches uh you know um war psychology and uh you know wow. psychological warfare and um you know he's ex-military that's doing that very kind of stuff and you know we've got guys that are that are teaching everything from you know, firearm skills to you know dutch ovens to um you know, I teach, you know, how to grow my garden. I teach, you know, how, how we have, you know, totally unconventional livestock, uh, but it works, you know, just kind of like my garden and, and my greenhouse, which is, you know, an engineering. Um, I mean, it's just brilliant in terms of how we, how we do what we do with the greenhouse and it gives us food year round and, and heats our home in the winter and heats our, our hot water year round. Um, and, uh, you know, all basically runs off of passive solar and uh you know then i also teach uh, you know what we've been talking about beforehand which is basically how to get off the grid starting now and you know that goes for everything from from looking for a site to uh, the actual construction of a of a building that is efficient in the first place so you don't have to spend 40 to sixty thousand dollars worth of solar panels to try mm -hmm. to make up for a really bad design in the first place to you know heat your home making those type what do they call them type one errors or something like that you know just that that's great so yeah. design right yeah. from the from the ground up hey yeah literally well literally yeah yeah so when was what was the first year of prepper camp what year was that did you say or do you remember i mean you're, you're this is our ninth year i think it was uh was it 2014 i'm not okay. sure maybe it was oh, yeah. okay 
And yeah. did you have did you have a decent turnout that first year? Oh yeah, yeah we did, yeah we did, and uh, you know we actually have limited the the attendees every year. <laughs> Um, okay. Because we don't want it to be, you know, uh, uh, like a like the conventions were. I mean, we want yeah. our speakers to be accessible. We want our vendors to be accessible. Yeah. Uh, even though we have a lot of people and we are the largest, you know, preparedness event in the country, it is you don't feel crowded. And um, you know, there's just you'll see it when you're there. Um, and you can ask your your brethren in the prepper broadcasting area. I'm sure you've talked to them about prepper camp, but yep. there's an aura about the place that that can only be you know god ordained because it's it's not us that does that it's just there's there's just this this aura about the place and the people and you know it's none of the none of the preppers are are you know tinfoil hat people they're just nice. normal people that just want to take care of their families and be mm -hmm. self-sufficient and um you know it's just you get a lot of really really good people that you know have their their heads and their hearts in the right place and um you know like i said there's just kind of a, a presence there i mean our first year we you know it's our first year and we didn't know how it's sure. going to go and we didn't know if we're going to do a second one and you know there was some torrential downpours and rains then and, and we had some really terrible storm warnings you got people in tents and you know that kind of stuff well you know we're watching this huge black cloud with thunderstorms and lightning bolts coming down and literally these clouds parted around prepper camp and went around and out I mean, just look at that. And, and the hair stood up on the back of our necks and said, I think we're doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> hair stick on the back of my neck. Now you just tell them the story. That's cool. Yeah. So how many people come now? Roughly? I don't even know if I ever asked anyone that question. Uh, 2,000 yeah. people. Yeah. That's a good crew. And how many, uh, you said about 30 speakers? Uh, I think we're close to 40 this year. I mean, we've okay. actually added more, more tents and more classes this year. So there's, there's a, you know, 64 classes a day, eight classes an hour for eight hours a day. So there's a lot to choose from, you know, for everything <laughs> from learning how to trap animals to, uh, you know, tan hides to make cheese, um, you know, to, uh, to, to make food taste good that's your storage food you know what to do with rice Great. and beans so you don't get you know food fatigue you yeah. know that's that's important for you know um morale um in a in a in a bad situation and uh you know they they have seen uh there have been all kinds of studies of of, of people that have lived in antarctica and okay. um you know these people are in the worst possible environment on earth and um you know they're stuck all together in this enclosed space and the one who has the most power is not the biggest not the strongest not the smartest it's the chef ah because they can make everybody's life miserable or you know wonderful so don't piss Probably off the chef works um, on a submarine too i'll bet That's uh, really yeah cool. yep. yeah that's yep. all. I never even thought about that, but everybody want to stay in the damn chef uh, good graces simply. Yeah, that's you really got it. cool. You got it. Yeah. So talking about food, <clears throat> I watched a few old interviews with you and you'd mentioned that you thought, I don't know if I got the wording right, but basically that rabbits were either the easiest or the most cost effective way to raise protein. Do you still feel yeah. that way? Yeah. Well, rabbits, rabbit. Yeah. Rabbits are famous for something. Um, you know, they, <laughs> they do what they do naturally. Um, three girls and one boy okay. will make 90, nine zero full grown rabbits in a year. Wow. Um, I've got champagne d'argent rabbits. They're a French silver rabbit. They, they're a 12 pound rabbit. Um, you know, they get to be about 12 pounds in two to three months. Um, and they dress out at about 10 pounds because, you know, rabbits are, are high, high protein, low fat, uh, low, you know, high protein to bone ratio, <clears throat> so for 12 pound rabbit they dress out to about 10 pounds of meat yes, uh, 90 rabbits is yeah. is 900 pounds of meat um that you can raise in your garage right um 
you know, and, and they're quiet. Nobody knows you have them. They don't take up a lot of space. They don't require a lot of food, um, you know, and they do what they do. Now, we raise them. You know, we went from raising them in cages and having to, you know, arrange courtships and do all that sort of stuff and, you know, clean up their poop and, you know, and then deal with the babies. Um, and I finally just said, hey, you know what? Every other animal we have free ranges on this property. Why right. aren't we doing this with the rabbits? So they're in an enclosed space. Um, they're not in cages. They basically it's a rabbit colony. Okay. Um, they do what they do. I don't do any arranged marriages. They just do what they do and I don't have to do anything about it. And, you know, they m magically make babies every month, um, you know, all the girls. And so we're producing a, a lot of rabbits and we've got, uh, you know, an area with with just a cat door that locks both ways that they can go in and out of that. It took them a day to figure out and then they go in and out. And then, so they're out in the in the, uh, you know, the shaded area underneath a giant air um a giant net that keeps them pr protected from the birds of prey which is the biggest problem with rabbits sure. um so you know it's all chicken wired and screened in and they've got this nice little bunny park they can be in and on top of that bunny park what get, provides the shade is uh, muscadine grape vines so you know we've got grapes growing on top of that little arbor for them and um oh. you know it's uh it's another place that we're growing food. So can they, uh, I suppose if they drop, can they get some of those grapes as well? Or do they just, yeah, they uh, can eat them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and how um, much do you have to supplement? Um, feed, we provide them with food from the garden. So, okay. you know, they, they do everything from chew on sticks of, you know, pear trees to the fruit that we have. And then in the wintertime, I grow uh, barley uh, in the greenhouse. And, um, you know, I've got a great little video on how to do that, but basically taking barley seed and you stack up uh, just these cheap little containers that you can buy from Walmart and mm -hmm. you punch holes in one end and you stack them up on the greenhouse shelves and you pour water in one and the water goes through that and then down to the next one and down to the next one and down to the next one. And the beauty of that is that um, one pound of seed will make 13 pounds of feed of forage in eight days is that like microgreens basically uh yeah pretty much yeah pretty okay. much so it's yeah it's wow. it's greens and the rabbits will eat you know any leftover seeds they'll eat the roots they'll eat the you know the the uh, the greens themselves um so you know you take one pound of seed and you get 13 pounds of feed in eight days by just adding water. Wow. It almost no work. You, I could do that in my, like I, I've grown lettuce in my office where I am right now. Mm -hmm. I could do that sitting right over there. No problem at all. Yeah. And it's not just the rabbits. I mean, the, you know, the, the goats will eat that. The ducks will eat that. So I've got pictures of, of the ducks in the snow. Um, and I throw, you know, little bits of this stuff out, um, you know, just basically cut it in squares and throw it out to them. And, you know, they're eating greens in the snow. Wow. <laughs> so what about um, the rabbit poop? Because isn't that, can you use that right away? Uh, rabbit or? poop is great. You know, we, we went to a, we went to some kind of libtard, um, <laughs> you know, it, it was a Mother Earth news fair um, oh, in, okay. yeah. in Asheville, which is... Okay. Uh, as libtard as it gets. Fair um, enough. And, um, you know, we were walking around looking at the vendors and, you know, learning what we could from people about, you know, food and, you know, growing stuff and, and husbandry. And uh, so, you know, we, we were looking and this booth was selling um, this highly nutritious fertilizer in a small little jar for five bucks and it was rabbit poop. And I turned to my wife and said, we're rich. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a great fertilizer and you know, I don't, I don't buy any chemical fertilizers, but I use all of that stuff and the stuff that we scrape out of the barn that the, the girl goats make and throw that out there. And you know, that just adds to the, uh, to the, the soil. Um, so we started here with red clay and, you know, we've got now uh, about two feet of topsoil. Um, that's just rich, rich stuff. Can you, 
elaborate a little on that? I'd love to. We, we got about 15 minutes yet. So um, how did you build your soil? What did you? What, um, I mean? I, well, it's it's really kind of using that whole permaculture, um, yeah. you know, the secret garden of survival thing, because let's let's start with this. Um, okay. You know, my wife um, was a straight row girl, a little OCD. You'll meet her. You'll find out. Um, sure. But she, you know. <laughs> She was straight row garden and this whole concept just kind of freaked her out and she was a weed puller and uh, you know ah. I had to eventually banish her from the garden because I said you you cannot pull weeds weeds are a um, are really the first plant they're a pioneer plant they're the first plant in succession they'll break okay. up the soil so they'll take something like red clay they'll break it up they'll grow where nothing else will grow they'll allow water air and and um, microbes to get into that soil and then they huh. die and they become food for the next series of plants so when you pull weeds you set your whole um your whole growth cycle back over a year so right. these people that are pulling weeds are doing absolutely the wrong thing so and weeds are flowering all the time all year long so i've got honeybees and you know that's feed for them all the time and uh so they make a lot of uh a lot of honey for me and i get about 60 pounds of honey per hive per year so um you know aside from them being able to pollinate all my fruit trees and my nuts and berries and everything else um you know they've got uh um you know they've got all of that stuff that they can then use to make make honey for me so you know i kind of consider myself a landlord i give them uh, you know a place to live and uh, twice a year i go collect the rent and um you know honey is is nature's perfect food i mean it's cool. it's got great medicinal qualities it it's uh great for um, both internal and external medicine they can use it you can use it to uh you know i mean they actually are using raw honey now to pack um people who have necrosis as a result of having uh, diabetes and their toes are falling off their toes don't grow back but you know nothing else is stopping it um you know it stops MRSA um wow so it's it's uh you know it's absolutely um a great source uh to have for you know for a prepper um and and we sweeten everything with it so we don't have any of that you know gmo sugar that we're you know we're using um so you know that's that's part of my livestock plan too and it's really not a lot of work i mean you just again just give them a place to live make sure they get plenty of room to expand and then uh you know you go collect the rent twice a year have you had any trouble with die-off winter die-off as a lot of people have or have you been oh uh, yeah and and yeah. just the whole colony collapse disorder which yep. is which is a result of Pesticide. of corn oh of, well it's genetically modified corn um you know it's it's corn pollen and what you end up having with this Monsanto manufactured, uh, you know, bestiality corn is that <laughs> it's, um, you know, corn is a grass, so it air pollinates. So it blows all over the place and, you know, the bees will invariably pick it up. It's a, it's a low level pollen. Um, so they'll store it. And so they'll eat all the other good stuff until winter is almost over. And Fair when they enough. do, it gives them dementia. So um, really? I, I had somebody growing corn, you know, within and bees will travel five miles for food. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of my my food forest is they really don't have to go very far to to get pollen and, and nectar. And, um, you know, the the more trips they make, the more honey they make for me uh, and the healthier that they are. So, you know, if they can go back and forth. My my bees are right outside of my garden. So they just keep going back and forth and getting stuff. But they will pick that stuff up. Now, I, you know, the people that were growing corn are no longer there. Okay. Um, I didn't burn them out, although I thought about it several times. But, um, you know, they, um, you know, they, I had some issues with it. I had some issues as so many farmers that are growing, you know, that have bees or people that have bees that are close to a farm that's growing corn and that really is the that really is the the issue and of course nobody's really talking about it but the problem is that um you know if if the deep bee population dies and they've studied mm. this they've war game this too if the bee population dies 70 percent of the food that we eat is uh, pollinated by honeybees right. so 
you know, now uh, in four years, uh, humanity dies. And maybe right. that's part of their plan, too. You know, maybe that's part of the whole great reset. But um, so, so uh, I do what I can to keep that from happening and keep pesticides and stuff away from them. So thanks. Nice. Um, so Jaggy, he's a brother of ours from over in Scotland. Uh, he's got it even harder than we do in Canada. Uh, he wants to know, do you have any fish with aquaponic systems at all? Uh, yeah, actually, um, you know, we looked into aquaponics and again, you know, you've got mecha electromechanical devices to make it all work. And, you know, if you're really doing, if you're doing something like tilapia, which is everybody's favorite, mm -hmm. that's a tropical fish. So sure. you've got to heat the area that they're in. So if you've got to be smart about what you're growing for fish. And so we stocked our pond, uh, which we dug into the side of this mountain, um, you know, and and lined with an old pool liner. And, uh, you know, we stocked it with with catfish um, oh. and sunfish. And, uh, you know, they're they're from this region. So they're able to handle the weather and the freeze overs and that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, we we do have that. And, you know, they're bottom feeders. So they kind of maintain themselves. We don't interfere. And. You know, we've got, uh, you know, um, I can't remember how many thousands of gallons of water are in that pond, but we've got that as a resource if we ever need it. And they, you know, they live there and it's a place for our ducks to swim around in. And, you know, it's like like summer at the at the, the community pool. You know, they they get out in the morning, they're out there flashing and playing and then they get then they go to work in the garden and they eat, you know, bugs and slugs and snails. And, you know, unlike chickens, they don't they don't scratch up roots so I can have them in there and um, you know, they keep uh, you know, they keep everything going and they fertilize behind them and then turn those bugs and slugs and snails into protein for me in terms of eggs. That's an easy way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, how cold does it get where you are? Like um, overall um, we've had winters where we've had 33 degrees below zero with a wind chill factor. Okay. And, so and, I've got, and uh, yeah. And I've got pictures of, of growing oranges in my greenhouse with a blue snow out there um, outside the window. So it's really, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I it, and that's full, is it only heated with solar, your greenhouse, or do you have wood supplemental too? Or nope. No, we don't supplement it at all. And, and because wow. it's an, well, it's an insulated greenhouse. So again, this is a totally mm -hmm. different concept. So, right. You know, it's an insulated greenhouse. It's got, you know, windows, of course, that the sun can come in and it's got, you know, glazing on the top and glazing on the sides. Okay. But the windows, the windows are triple pane argon filled windows. So they're super oh, efficient. Around. Yeah, they're, they're super efficient. So they allow heat and, and, you know, light to get in, but they don't really allow it to escape. So, wow. you know, in the in the wintertime, basically it, it always maintains above 45 degrees, no matter how cold it is outside. And and because we've got this huge thermal mass of, uh, of filled in concrete blocks because we, we put in planters essentially so that we're working at waste level for the plants that we have planted in there. And then we've got also got other plants in pots that, you know, are the big trees. Like we grow coffee trees. Uh, we grow, you know, citrus in there and citrus doesn't grow here naturally and neither do coffee trees, but right. you know, who hasn't said they die for a cup of coffee? Well, you know, we talked about morale, and <laughs> yep. uh, you know my my survival crew is going to be happy to have coffee when there isn't any. Um, you know when we when we do have uh, you know the worst of worst of things happen, the end of the world as we know it. So, wow, that's incredible! I I didn't even know you were growing coffee. I didn't know you were growing citrus for that matter. Yeah, and is it a lot of work? <laughs> no, no, no. I, can't no. I, I we use the same kind of concept in in the greenhouse that we do in the garden. You know. Um, just let it go plant once and, you know, take care of it. And we, we have natural predators in the greenhouse. You know, I had, to, I had to teach my wife to stop taking out the spider uh, eggs that were in the corners because spiders are your best pesticide. Right. And they take care of a lot of the, I yeah, yeah, that's incredible. I, I know there's a few people that a greenhouse year around here in Alberta, but it's a tricky proposition, of course, yeah. but that, you, that must have been quite an investment to go triple pane argon filled windows for a not greenhouse. really not really no no it wasn't really that much it was just you know doing the infrastructure right the first time sure. and uh you know i as a i mean i went to one of these stupid libtard conferences where somebody was so proud of their earth ship that they called <laughs> that they yep. you know they had this greenhouse attached to their house 
and the guy was talking about how you know it was cold out and you know below zero and he was up at four o'clock in the morning stoking the wood stove and i said you're an idiot i mean it's just an idiot i mean why why do you set yourself up with a stupid thing to start with i mean if you do what i'm doing in terms of an insulated greenhouse you don't have to do that and you've got enough thermal mass the sun heats it up during the day gives off heat evenly at night uh, without having to do any supplemental heat whatsoever so um you know just take some some cues from nature and uh you know, as a result, it's just, it's been, it's been a ride and it's, it works well. And, you know, which is why, you know, my wife and I give back by doing the speaking thing, by writing the books, by doing the videos and, uh, you know, by doing prepper camp that to, to us, that is our ministry. You know, that right. is what we do. And, you know, we do it once a year. It's about 10 months of planning and work to put on a three day event. Um, and, uh, you know, do the best that we possibly can do with that and teach as many people as we can. And, you know, we've we've gotten a lot of kudos from people and thanks from people in the, you know, a after the fact. I mean, when this whole pandemic thing happened, um, <laughs> you know, it, uh, it there were a lot of people that reached out to us and said, you know, if it wasn't for prepper camp, I might not be alive right now. That's and, awesome. you know, we had food storage. We had stuff. We, you know, we were able to to maintain and you know for our in our own circumstance you know we when we first found out about this we thought hey china uh biological weapon okay uh maybe we don't want to go into town and get whatever this thing is so yeah. you know we didn't we don't have to we grow right. all our own food so you know my wife and i were sitting on a swing looking out at the mountains you know watching the goats grazing in front of us and and she just kind of turned to me with a little smirk on her face and said, you realize there's a worldwide pandemic right now? And I said, oh, yeah, that's right. There is. Um, so, you know, if you're prepared and self-sufficient, you don't have to be, you know, worried and thinking about stuff like that. And that's that's security. I mean, yeah. that really is security. Um, you know, and and people right now are, are, are waking up to you know, food prices and, you know, yeah. fuel tripling in price and, you know, food prices uh, tripling, quadrupling in price and stuff suddenly not being on the store shelves. Um, you know, it's, I mean, you know, we, we very rarely go into town and, you know, but we do swing by Walmart because we got to get supplies and, you know, we zip mm -hmm. through the grocery section and, you know, our dogs like peanut butter and it's a pain in the ass to oh. make for us to make it. So, you know, we go through and there hasn't been peanut butter on the shelves, any zero on the wow. shelves for two weeks. And I'm going, Hmm, I wonder if that's one of the food processing plants that they burned down, yep. you yep. know, of the nine, the 92 that have been burned down in, uh, since uh, the last couple of months, you know, maybe this whole food shortage thing is part of the plan. I'm thinking. But you get to sit at home and not work. Like I said, if, if nobody told you there was a worldwide pandemic going on, you wouldn't have known, would you? Yep. Right. And so as a result, my wife said, hey, you know what? We need to stock up on uh, on peanuts is, you know, that that actually we can grow from. So because we've yeah. done it in the past. So, you know, it's easy. And and peanuts is another one of those nitrogen fixers, um, you know. So plant that in the ground and dig up the the peanuts and save some of those nuts just like we save seeds from everything and you can plant some more next year and one seed will produce a bunch of different plants i love it well we've been i, I said i'd keep it to an hour so how do people find out uh it, it, are there still tickets even available for prepper camp yeah yeah there okay. still are um so how, are, do they, how do people find and how do we get there <laughs> um it's preppercamp.com Okay. It's that simple. Um, just, you know, you can see what's going on. Uh, you can see the speakers. You can see a, a big part of the new classes that we've got this year. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we don't post the schedule until two weeks before the event because shit happens. Stuff changes, yep. you know. Um, you know, so. speakers, you know, their, their dad dies of uh, COVID vaccine and suddenly, you know, they got to go and they can't come. So, 
yep. you know, those are kind of things that we don't post a schedule until we're two weeks out and then things are pretty much, you know, cast in stone. And so, you know, everything but the schedule, you're going to get the different classes and, and people, people are amazingly prepared for some reason they come and meticulous and they've got all their classes mapped out what they want to see at what hour and you know if if their spouse is with them they might go to separate classes because she might go to a cheese making class and he's going to go to a you know a trapping class or something like that or you know a, a skinning and butchering class so you know you got all that stuff going on at the same time so uh, you'll see all that at preppercamp.com and uh, you know we are selling tickets still um and uh the, the ticket price is nothing compared to um you know everything else that's involved i mean we have people coming from california that are dragging a an rv a trailer um you know across country and it ain't going to be cheap this year with gasoline prices nope. so i mean it's it is it is nothing the ticket price compared to what but we're not it's not to make money for us it's not a money maker you know if i was I'd make more money flipping burgers at McDonald's, honestly, for the number <laughs> of hours I spend doing this. But again, it's it's our ministry. And this is, you know, we're teaching people how to how to survive so that there'll be some some good people left that can help put, uh, you know, this this civilization back together when um, all of those uh, Satanists crawl into a hole and um, wait for it all to be over. Well, you, you are a good man, Mr. Austin. I appreciate it. I, uh, you're a born teacher. I, I only got to know you just recently through James, really. Um, uh -huh. I, I appreciate you for, for what I've run into so far. So thank you. I, man, this was great. I can't wait to meet you in person. Uh, it'll be great. Likewise. Likewise. So yeah, we're, you probably won't see much of me because I'm okay. like zipping, zipping by one place to another. I'm, I'm trying to keep the lid on everything so that everything is completely seamless. So you know, totally it's, get it. my biggest bane of his ex existence in prepper camp is technology. If I could do it without technology, it would be great. But, you know, we've got PowerPoint presentations and you got TVs and you got electricity <laughs> and you got, you know, computers and everything's going to talk to each other. And, you know, you got to have backups for the backups so that if something goes down, you got a quick replacement to stick in there and um, you know, that's, that's the, the, the hardest thing and the biggest issue. And, and plus I'm teaching three classes. So, you know, out of the day, so it's, there's a lot to do. Um, right. but it's, uh, you know, it's for me, it's, it's after we packed up and gone home and it's like, Oh, that went well. So <laughs> I'm good at the run by handshake. So I'll run by, shake your hand, say hello and keep not going. a problem. Problem, Those events yeah. are, yeah, they're killer for the, the host. So thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yep. Well, thank you for having me. I, I, I appreciate being on. And, you know, the more people, like I said, we can teach to be prepared, the better we'll all be. Amen. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night, Rick. Thanks for dropping by the workshop. Good night to you, too. Take care. Bye. <laughs> well, guys, that was incredible. I, I don't know what else to say. I appreciate Rick. He's a great feller. And it was just absolutely awesome to have him on here. So make sure you go by, check out uh, Prepper Camp and check out, I have all his links in the show. And yeah, just one more time, uh, say a great big workshop. Thank you. And guys, as always, stay happy, stay healthy and have a great week.